Hi, I'm George Dory, and welcome to our Coast to Coast AM YouTube channel. Have fun, tell your friends, and share us with everyone. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Coast to Coast AM's mobile app. And always remember to log on to our website at coasttocoastam.com for daily articles, the best paranormal information, and all you need to know about your favorite guests. And now you can become a Coast Insider directly through the Coast mobile app. We welcome our international listeners and even offer a free two-week trial. So don't delay. Become an insider today. Brad Olson has traveled to the far-flung corners of the earth. Now, when I say corners, I'm, I'm not saying the earth is flat. It's just an expression, folks. He's traveled the globe, <laughs> including Antarctica, the mysterious and practically empty continent, except for the emperor penguins. It's a desolate land of ice and snow and active underwater volcanoes. And it's what lies beneath the ice of the South Pole, where we'll turn our attention in the first half of Coast to Coast, rumored underground Nazi bases, ancient structures, a pyramid, perhaps even an opening leading into the interior of our hollow earth. And more recently, reports of a gigantic alien craft slowly emerging from the melting ice that has been secretly visited by numerous heads of state and religious leaders. Brad Olson's passion for writing goes far beyond his book publishing business or the online content he produces. He's also the founder and event producer of the How Weird Street Fair in San Francisco, the city where he currently resides. Between writing online and print publication articles, new book chapters and posting on social media, he also manages various websites, does marketing work, special sales fulfillment, administrative tasks, manages various projects with outsourced collaborators and produces one of the largest festivals in the city. Wearing his publisher's hat, he makes the stated goal of only releasing the kinds of books he would value owning himself, which incorporates thought-provoking and critical content with a wide appeal to readers. His book publishing business, CCC Publishing, is distributed by Independent Publishers Group. He's the author of numerous books, including Sacred Places of North America, Modern, Modern Esoteric, future esoteric and beyond esoteric escaping prison planet brad olson welcome back to coast to coast am how are you buddy hey richard i'm doing great thanks for having me back it's always wonderful to talk to you when when were you in uh, the antarctic how many um, years ago was that now yeah that was four and a half years ago and if you remember, we were on coast to coast when I was in San Carlo di Berloche, Argentina, just about ready to head down to Ushuaia, where I got on a sailboat with my then partner, Emily Infinity, and we had a 26-day sailboat excursion to the Palmer Peninsula. How long does it take to cross over? I mean, it just seems like when you look at a map between this, the bottom of South America and that that our Antarctic Peninsula, it just seems like a little a little gap. It's 26 days, did you say? Well, that's how long the trip was. It took us ah. 92 hours to get yeah, 92 hours. Okay. to our first uh, anchorage, which was King George Island, one of the uh, Pan-Antarctic islands off of the Palmer Peninsula. So is that now, have you been to all seven continents? Yes, I have. So that was the seventh, right? That you've ticked off that, that box. The That's the hardest one, Richard. That's the one, <laughs> the feather in the cap, you should say. And I mean, how do you prepare for a trip like that? I mean, how do you how how does one pack to go to the Antarctic? <laughs> well, I had bought a a vehicle in Santiago, Chile, and drove. Oh boy, about three thousand kilometers, including all the way the full stretch of. Argentina. It was just the clothes and gear that I had for uh, this particular trip. But we did go out and buy ski goggle, mask, uh, also gloves. Uh, I had an army hat that was waterproof uh, and a real heavy duty jacket and wore many layers as well. But when you go down there, even though it's still got, you know, ice and snow, it's it's summer, right? That's is that the time that you go in? Well, it's it's December here, but it's summer down there. That's correct. So think opposite seasons, of course, because it's southern hemisphere. 
the window of opportunity to travel in Antarctica is from mid-November until mid-March. And then the window closes because it is quite cold, but not always that cold. Just, for example, if you were to go to the Arctic Circle region of Alaska or northern Canada, there are warm days that you could wear a T-shirt, which was the case. There were a couple days it was sunny out, and we wore uh, T-shirt and shorts, our bathing suits, on the deck of the boat. Wow. Um, so what was your ultimate destination when you, I mean, you're, 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 uh, traveling to the Antarctic Peninsula. If you look at the map of the, the continent and it is a continent, it's, um, you know, it's this little, this little, well, it's a peninsula sticking out from sort of the main continent, sort of pointed towards South America, I believe the tip of South America, but what's your ultimate destination when you get there? Well, there were several points of reference that we went to, but uh, the way I describe it is that it pulled up two fingers. One is the southern tip of South America, and then the other finger, on the other hand, holding up is the Palmer Peninsula. It is the closest continent to Antarctica. And so once we got to the islands off the Palmer Peninsula, there were several destinations. The first place we dropped anchor was at King George Island, and that was... Uh, a base run by the country Poland called Arktowski. And we had 11 Poles on the trip and three Americans. Boy, I can tell you, Richard, after that very rough crossing of the Drake Passage where uh, three quarters of our crew and passengers got violently seasick, including myself, I think I lost about 25 pounds on that trip. I'm not kidding. Uh, wow. mainly in those five days when I didn't eat at all. So stepping on terra firma on King George Island was, boy, was that a relief. So one of your destinations was an area that, I don't know if this is your name for it um, or it came from somewhere else, but you'll tell me. And that is, uh, there's a, a part of Antarctica referred to as Illuminati Disneyland. Well, Well, that was indeed... What I was going down to Antarctica to discover is if there were were any truth to these massive ships under the ice or pyramids poking through or uh, antediluvian civilizations trapped under the ice or what this uh, concept of Illuminati Disneyland was. And I, I think I do have a pretty good idea of where and what it is, but it wasn't where we were going. Where we were going was pretty much the... Uh, the designated route where cruise ships would go and other sailboats that we saw a sea, including a group that was scuba diving down there. And that sure looked cool. One day we went aboard their boat and they played a bunch of videos and showed us the pictures underwater, Richard. It's like a coral reef. There are colorful animals and plants under the ice, as well as shipwrecks and swimming under the ice shelves. Boy, that is extreme scuba diving adventure. So um, I've got the map here of the, of Antarctic. I'm looking at it. Uh, where, where would the um, designated Illuminati Disneyland be? What is it like beyond the Pensacola mountains or is it in West Antarctica or, or is it uh, Queen Maud mountains area? Where is it? Well, I do believe it's at the uh, one degree past the South pole which is the rumored home of the giant hole under the ice. And this is information that was gleaned by Linda Moulton Howe interviewing her whistleblower named Brian S., who had flown over it after they were told not to. When I was on with George Norrie on his show, Beyond Belief, we were talking just before the show and I explained to him that there was this big no-fly zone area to a one side of the South Pole Amundsen-Scott station. And when I was explaining it to George, I said, there's this big no-fly zone. And he said, well, why would anybody need to not fly there? Why would you have to uh, uh, hold this area protected? And they are doing experiments. That's the cover story. But I do believe it's because there's this big gaping hole under the ice there at about 89 degree parallel south. I say that because 
this is where a lot of the elite were going to. Most especially Prince Harry went down there in this 2016-2017 season range when a lot of the elite were going down there. And he goes down to South Pole with a bunch of his uh, army buddies, and they go cross-country skiing in that direction uh, for several days. Well, apparently there's nothing there. Apparently it's just the Polar Plateau, which is up over two miles high. It's uh, very high and very dry there. And that is what Antarctica is, a pretty much a desert continent of this giant polar plateau, frozen ice. So you're saying that that uh, uh, Prince Harry and his army buddies, they've gone there. They know that this there's an entrance there to the interior of the uh, our hollow earth. And this was discovered by Admiral Byrd on his first fly over the South Pole. He was the first aviator to fly over the South Pole. I have maps showing the direction that he flew, and he would have spotted it because it's several kilometers wide. And when he went back during Operation High Jump, he was summoned there. He wrote about this in his diary that he flew right on back to the South Pole, and there were three hours of missing time during Admiral Byrd's flight, and they were monitoring him from Little America, the base that he flew out from, with just a radio man. And they felt that there was a, enough area to drop the plane into this big hole and enough room to circle back. And what he saw down there would be the Illuminati Disneyland. Yeah, the the uh, the diaries that I guess were published what around the mid nineteen nineties. Um, I'm not sure was it his son that that published them. I mean, yeah. highly contentious. People say, oh, they might be a forgery. They may be the real thing. What is he? Uh, what do the diaries say specifically about what he encountered once he entered into the, uh, I guess, the interior of the hollow earth? Well, this is where it gets really incredible, and this was nowhere near where I went. We all have to understand that Antarctica is a massive continent. It's the fifth largest continent of the world, so the distances are very vast. To be able to go to the South Pole, it is possible. I talked to a tour operator that does trips out there. Of course, you fly in on the side you're supposed to fly in. You're not going near this hole. But what Admiral Byrd spoke of when he went into the hole, he wrote about it in his diary that was published by his son, Yeah, as he said in the 1990s, that there was verdant green valleys down there. He couldn't believe his eyes. What could be growing in Antarctica? And I'll tell you, Richard, when I was there, I didn't see any tree or shrub or nothing really green at all. It's just ice and black rock and blue ocean. And so he goes down there and he, he's flying in and he writes in his diary that he sees something like an elephant. He takes a closer look and it's a woolly mammoth. He keeps on flying, and then two ships uh, intercept his plane at wing to wing, and then he loses control of the flight. They take him in to what he describes like a crystal city. I always imagine it to be like in The Wizard of Oz when they go to the Emerald City, some fantastical civilization under the ice, in which time they land, and he notes that they had German accents and there were swastikas and other Third Reich insignias, both on their uniform and on the craft. And he was summoned to meet what he described as the master. And so the radio man had to stay behind. Admiral Byrd went into this crystal city where he had audience with this so-called master who lectured him on the irresponsible nature of using atomic weapons. Now, mind you, this is in late 1946, so the Second World War had just ended with the bombing of Nagasaki and Hiroshima in Japan and also the atomic tests at White Sands in New Mexico. So he was given a very stern warning to take back to his superiors in Washington, D.C., that they were not happy with America having these nuclear bombs akin to a child with matches playing with them in a very dry forest. And he was then escorted out by the same 
to airmen with German accents, and they even said uh, goodbye to him in German as they flew back out those missing three hours. And then he went back to uh, Little America and then subsequently back to the United States. Uh, Where he was presumably debriefed uh, at the Pentagon or someplace. Did he ever speak of it again? He couldn't speak of it publicly ever again, but he did speak to his family members, including his son and his wife, quite frequently about it. You can imagine what a uh, shocking experience that would be. And this was on the tail of Operation High Jump, in which he was the admiral in charge. When they were going back, Richard, he quipped to a Chilean reporter from the newspaper El Mercurio not to uh, be alarming This is his quote. I'm paraphrasing a bit. But we will be confronted with an enemy that has the ability to fly pole to pole at incredible speeds, end quote. And he was not supposed to say that. Uh, And he was rather chastised for uh, talking to the press, in fact, making this uh, quote that you can still find in the archives of El Mercurio magazine uh, newspaper. so you have to explain the the um, the Nazi paraphernalia in the interior of the Earth. The he referred to this uh, the, the the master. So these are what enlightened uh, beings that live down there. Why are they Why are they uh, hanging around with the, uh, the that vile bunch, the Nazis down there? If they're so enlightened. <laughs> Good point. Good question. That is, uh, I don't know the answer to that, but we do know that in the late 1930s, the Nazis were very interested in setting up a colony, a base called Base 211 in the New Schwabenland claim, which is in Queen Maud land, you said in the setup. That is also the location of one of the giant craft that's presumed to be under the ice. And I was able to discover that uh, in my research. I was poring over maps before my trip. I love maps. I'm a cartographer myself. And I was very surprised to see that the Germans had never left that new Schwabenland area, even after World War II. During the Cold War, they kept their bases open and operating. The Conan base, which is inland, and also the Neumeyer base closer to the coast where West Germany and now unified Germany still have bases to this day. Ostensibly, you know, we're told that they were there for, they were sending these factory ships there. They wanted to uh, um, I do some whaling down there, I guess, produce some whale oil uh, for the war effort or something. But what were they really after, do you think, Brad? Yeah, that's the big $10 million question, Richard, because you could go whaling in the North Atlantic, much closer to Germany it's quite an effort to go all the way down to the land holding that they claimed by dropping these giant darts in the area that they claimed for Germany. That was their land claim. And the Admiral at the time of the middle of World War II in 1943, Admiral Donitz, he made a very famous statement to the U-boat team that he was in charge of. He said, we have found and created for the Fuhrer an impregnable fortress in a area of eternal ice. I'm paraphrasing again, but he basically said that we have created this uh, Shangri-La in the uh, polar regions. And they did have bases in Greenland, the Thule base in northern Greenland, which incidentally is still managed by the U.S. to this day. And that was when uh, Trump said we would like to buy Greenland from Denmark, which uh, controls that uh, small continent. And they said no. But uh, the the Nazis were very interested in having these far-flung bases, New Schwabenland being one of them. So uh, these would be what, underground or uh, underwater, underground submarine bases? Or were they above ground? The Germans in World War II were, had cutting-edge technology with their submarine fleet. They called them the U-boats. And it's presumed that the U-boats even went under the ice. There are 
in my presentation that I do at conferences called The Hidden Anomalies of Antarctica, I show maps of Antarctica without the ice. And there are very long, even 100-mile-long fjords that cut into the East Antarctica continent, including in New Schwabenland. So very intrepid U-boat captains, they have steered their U-boats deep well into the interior of Antarctica underwater. And there they could have found these giant under-ice domes because Antarctica is the most active volcanically active continent in the world. There's 91 known active volcanoes in Antarctica. So the propensity for these large under ice areas that are heated with geothermal heat would provide a refuge, uh, a Shangri-La in a kingdom of ice, as Admiral Dolan said. And how many, uh, did they move troops down there? Did they, I mean, one of the things I had read about years ago was, of course, the the Nazis had this uh, Liebensborn program where they were trying to, you know, uh, breed a master race uh, where they would take uh, women and breed them with these SS soldiers who were impossibly tall. And were, that the, the, there was a rumor that there was a Liebensborn program going down, going on down in one of these secret bases in New Swabia. Yes, indeed. So the the very first expedition, 1938-1939, was headed up by none other than Hermann Göring, who was the head of the Luftwaffe, the Air Force of the Third Reich. And this was a very important mission to the upper brass of Germany. So for Hermann Göring to really oversee this mission, they must have been going down there for something more than whale blubber and whale oil uh, to spend that much resources. Several hundred men were on the first expedition, including a mariner named Schumacher. And Schumacher landed one of their seaplanes in these lakes that he got the naming rights to called the Schumacher Ponds. They are geothermal lakes that never freeze, even in the frigid cold of an Antarctic winter. And his men went out on a mission near the Schumacher Ponds. This is where I believe Base 211 is located, because they went off on foot for several days while he stayed behind with the plane and was doing a depth check. So he was finding out that there was a thermocline in the Schumacher Ponds, meaning that down below, the water was much warmer towards the top, much colder. Usually it's the other way around in lakes. It gets colder when you dive down deep, and it's warmer on the top where the sun heats it up. Not the case in the Schumacher Ponds, and he was able to determine that this could be a, a, a viable place to land the seaplanes, but also provide geothermal heat. And... Um the um the the u boats um were they there was a lot of nazi plunder obviously uh that that was taken out of europe and some of it was rumored to have gone to south america places like argentina uh, uh maybe paraguay and other places like that um do you has your research led you to believe that maybe some of that nazi plunder gold and and uh, priceless works of art and so forth. It is some of it, which has never been recovered, may have been taken to, to these underwater, underground submarine bases in the Antarctic. Yeah, I do believe that's the case. There are many metric tons of gold bullion that left right at the tail end of World War II, never to be recovered. So you're taking the money out, and then the number two, at the end of the war, right under Hitler himself, was a man named Martin Bormann, who was actually tried in absence at the Nuremberg trials and put up, put to death. But uh, they had to catch him first. He kept popping up all over South America in the 1950s. And in Argentina and Chile, when I was down there, I was going to all these locations and discovering while I was looking at maps that there were large land holdings in Chile and Argentina, these micro-nations, so to speak, that they had controlled the way that anybody could come in or out, 
the airspace, uh, guard stations. And with unlimited amount of money, Richard, you can pretty much uh, run the show. And there was a, a joke that I heard when I was in South America, because most of the native people were basically wiped out in Chile and Argentina. So they're, they're having a little soul uh, journey. Who are we uh, if, if we don't have uh, Native American people anymore? And most of them are Southern Europeans, such as Italians or uh, Spanish or Greek. So the joke goes like this, that uh, who are we as Argentinians? Well, we're Italians who speak Spanish and wish that we were as rich as the Germans. <laughs> still the Germans to this day that control the largest amount of wealth. And I went to several German enclaves in Argentina, and I've been to Germany several times, and going into Bariloche was like walking into a southern Bavarian village. It was so similar in identification. There was a terrific show on the History Channel a few years ago. Uh, I think it was called Hunting for Hitler. Oh, yeah. The and the, the again, the rumor that he uh, escaped the Fuhrer bunker, did not commit suicide, nor did uh, Ava Braun, and that they escaped on a U-boat, uh, uh, perhaps via New Swabia, and then making their way to someplace like Argentina. What are your thoughts? Yeah, that's correct. So there's a place just south of Buenos Aires called La Plata, and their uh, U-boats were seen on several occasions, and one time just after the war when uh, several high-ranking Nazi officials got off, presumably Eva Braun, Adolf Hitler, and their dog Blondie made the journey too. Uh, just like leaders today, for security reasons, heads of state had doppelgangers or lookalikes. So most likely one of the doppelgangers was sacrificed in the the bunker at the end of World War II, and Hitler made his escape. And you referenced the History Channel show, Hunting Hitler, excellent series. And I went to many of these locations, one of which is in a town called La Falda, where the Eden Hotel had pictures of uh, the owner, the Eichhardt, having dinner with Hitler, and, and he was the, their favored guest. Uh, and so I took the tour, and I'm finishing up and that fortunately the the tour guides could speak english pretty well and i said do you, do you really think that hitler survived the war he goes oh i don't have to think i know it because right here in this town of la falda there's an old chambermaid she was now in her 90s but at the time after world war ii she was a young lady and she has testified even under oath that she saw hitler alive in the La Falda Hotel, the Eden Hotel. And the, La Falda is like a German enclave in these hills right above Cordoba, Argentina. Remarkable. Um, and so did he, any idea how, how long he, did he live out his days there? Was he back and forth between there and New Swabia? He probably went to the New Swabia base 211, and they were also talking about the new Berlin base in Antarctica. And I've identified two locations where I think both of them are. As I said, I think base 211 was near the Schumacher Ponds, but the new Berlin base is at an area called Beaver Lake, another geothermal feature. Even just outside of the confines of the new Schwabia land claim in Antarctica, and that might have been the more protected fortress. It has been said that they were they inherited a reptilian alien base that was given to them, that was not being used, but that they were allowed to use. And in the Battle of High Jump, which at first started with the air fleet flying over this base 211 and finding some outbuildings and first day dropping a few bombs on it, testing out the waters, so to speak, and also surveying the area around it. But day two, Admiral Byrd sent out a whole bunch of bombers, and on that flight, when they're about to start bombing Base 211, those planes and those pilots went off the radar screen, never to be seen or heard from again. Also on that same day, craft came up out of the water 
and confronted the armada of ships. And rather than just taking out the whole fleet, they just sunk one boat. They used what could be described as a direct energy weapon or a laser beam to slice one of those ships in half, which was, of course, at a great loss of life for any of the crew members on that boat. You die within minutes of hypothermia if you're in those frigid waters. And that was enough to send Admiral Byrd and the Operation High Jump, which was a six-month expedition, with their tails between their legs, back up to the country of origin. It wasn't just the U.S. It was other allied nations that were a part of Operation High Jump. And Admiral Byrd then made that famous quote, uh, that we would be facing an adversary that could fly pole to pole at incredible speeds because they could not shoot down those crafts, try as they might. They had a certain uh, force field around them, and then coming up out of the ocean as an unidentified submersible object, clearly technology far beyond the age of 1946 when the Battle of High Jump went down. Well, uh, this is, uh, or for, was it 46 or 47, but two years after the war supposedly ends and uh, we're, we're, we're to believe then that the, the, the Nazis were still, well, Germany surrendered at the end of the Second World War, but the Third Reich did not. Uh, right. Did they move their base of operation to uh, New Swabia and continued? You mentioned the uh, the Perry Reese map which is like over 500 years old. And uh, this Perry Reese, he was a, was he a Turkish naval officer in the 1500s? Yeah, that's right. He was a naval admiral in Turkey. In uh, 1513, he drafted the Perry Reese map, as it's known. It was just found uh, only a few decades ago in a palace in Istanbul, Turkey. And what it shows is remarkable, not only a very exact likeness of South America, the Caribbean, Africa on the other side of the Atlantic, as well as Spain and portions of Europe, but below South America, portions of Antarctica. Not only showing the continent some three centuries before it was discovered by whalers in 1821, but islands under the ice that have still yet to be discovered. Now, when I was down there, Richard, I went to the Palmer base, and one thing, the chief of the uh, Palmer base who let us come uh, ashore, which is an American base, and is this because three of us were American tax-paying citizens that they agreed to uh, let us come aboard uh, ashore to the tour of the Palmer facility? And the crew chief said, Oh, take a picture of that picture of the ice, and I'll show you why when we go outside. And when we went outside, he said, that is that area over there where you see this island with a cap of ice. But in the painting, it had just been a big ice shelf. So with the melting ice in this particular region of the Palmer Peninsula, a new island emerged that had not been known until just uh, several years ago. And it, it had a, a ice bridge connecting to the larger Anvers Island ice shelf that broke off. And then it happened to be on uh, Pi Day in middle of March. And so they gave it the nickname Pi Island. So islands are still being uh, discovered. And some of them trapped under the ice for who knows how long. But the the uh, the Perry Reese map uh, does it not show uh, an ice free Antarctic? Well, it does, and that's quite the uh, riddle of the Perry Reese map. Is how could they have known the outline of this portion of Antarctica, including these I- islands, which now are under the ice? And so, when I was um, doing this research and looking into these old maps. In fact, one of my conference presentations is about the maps of Antarctica before it was even discovered by several centuries. And it's not just the Peary Reese map. There are other maps, uh, even the Mercator map, the, the very revolutionary map that gave us 
the Earth in a three-dimensional plane also depicts Antarctica. So somehow this knowledge had been passed on. In the age of exploration, maps were among the most prized possession of any ship. So if a ship were to capture an enemy, one of the first things they would do is go into the strong box in the captain's quarter and take the maps. Before they even wanted the treasure, they would go for the maps. And indeed, in the liner notes of the Piri Reese map, it says that it was drawn from other source maps from Christopher Columbus, who was only two decades before Piri Reese. And to his dying day, Christopher Columbus never believed he had discovered a new continent. He thought he had discovered the islands off of India. And that's why our Native Americans got the nickname Indians uh, misidentified. But another reference on the Piri Reese map said that some of the source maps came all the way back from the time of the Library of Alexandria in Egypt. So uh, using different source maps uh, over a long period of time and collecting this information in the Piri Reis map to show Antarctica, that there may have been a time when Antarctica was free of ice and such a long time ago, perhaps even before the last ice age when it was originally mapped out. So let's talk about, um, we have to talk about this huge alien craft that is reportedly uh, slowly revealing itself as the, the ice around it melts. Uh, is that also located in uh, Queen Maud land or New Swabia? That is correct. So apparently there are three massive motherships that our intelligence agencies back in the 1970s had known about, and they nicknamed them the Nina Pinta and Santa Maria, which were the three ships of Columbus's maiden voyage. And I do believe that the one I identify and show images of in my conference presentation is one of those three mother ships. And so in 2013 on Google Maps, you can still go back in the Wayback Machine and find it. There's this base that's way out on the polar plateau, but in the confines of the Nazi claim of New Schwabenland. It's called the Conan Base, K-O-N-H-E-N. You can still see it on uh, modern maps today. It's a seasonal base, so nobody's out there right now. But in 2013, they were doing some kind of excavation at what to me looked like a big machine or an engine block, because it had all these, these wings that came off it. So in 2013, on the Wayback Machine, you can see that there's an excavation going on at this giant machine. There's a, even a runway strip for landing aircraft. Uh, there are snowmobile tracks that go around it. And then they kick up all this rust color or orange material on the ice. So they're, they're pulling something out, but then they uncovered this big grill of a machine. It's about a quarter mile long. And I love it when data points connect because the Farsight Institute, Courtney Brown heads that up with a bunch of remote viewers. They targeted the Conan base. And what they found and what they reported back was that it was certainly not a natural formation, that it was some kind of decrepit craft that had been there for perhaps millions of years, but it had been designed for very tall inhabitants that could have been 15 or 20 feet tall, that what was there in the, the passageways in there were just built for some massive species of, I would have to say, aliens, because humans don't grow that tall. Uh, extraterrestrial, or would they perhaps have come from the interior of the Earth? Or this mystery hole under the ice, perhaps, too, from this uh, crystal city. It does remain to be seen, but there are also reports that these giants were in a state of stasis, not in the Conan base, but in other locations. And right now, at this period of time, they're starting to wake up. Uh, it's also rumored that a number of uh, world figures have gone down there. John Kerry, 
uh, former President Barack Obama, I think even a bishop in the Russian Orthodox Church. Can you confirm or deny? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Higher than a bishop, it was Patriarch Krill himself, who was the, the patriarch of the entire Russian Orthodox Church. He's a little old man, and he's going all the way down to the harsh climate of Antarctica to bless a small Russian chapel. Well, but this is a, a cover story for what he was really doing down there. And But there were a lot of not only politicians like John Kerry on Election Day when uh, Hillary Clinton lost the presidential election. You'd think he would have been in the United States stumping for his candidate. No, he's down in Antarctica. He landed in McMurdo. I have a friend who, who works at the McMurdo base, which is the largest base in Antarctica run by America. And he showed up, big fanfare. Here's an acting secretary of state coming down to Antarctica. He went missing for several days. They flew off and they obviously had somewhere to go. Maybe going to check out the Illuminati Disneyland, which I think is the big hole in the ice, one degree from the South Pole, or perhaps going to another under ice base to get his marching orders on what a Trump presidency would mean to uh, those who may be operating under the ice in Antarctica. Those who may be operating. Um, I mean, the late Jim Mars wrote a book called um, Rise of, I think it was called The Rise of the Fourth Reich. Yep. Uh, Joseph Joseph Farrell, um, I think, wrote a book called The uh, Nazi Internationale, meaning that the, the Nazis, they didn't lose the war. They simply moved their base of operation, perhaps to uh, a base beneath New Swabia. Um, how do you feel about that? Do you think that, that, that it's that it's possible that the Nazis are still operating down there and, and somehow, I don't know, uh, pulling strings and, and stage managing world events and so forth? It's quite possible. And I have had the great opportunity of meeting Jim Mars and having uh, the opportunity to meet Joseph Farrell as well. Great researchers on this subject. And I myself have a chapter in my book, Future Esoteric, called The Fourth Reich in America showing quite a bit of evidence that at the end of World War II, while the fighting forces of Germany surrendered, as you mentioned at the top of the show, the Third Reich never surrendered in World War II, nor did the SS, the Secret Service Corps, which was really a, a secret society within the Third Reich, never surrendered either. And it's a pretty good chance that they escaped with a bunch of loot and artifacts, including the Spear of Destiny, which was the very first artifact that Hitler acquired when they absorbed Austria into the Third Reich. He went right in the museum, got the Spear of Destiny, which is the spear, the Roman spear that was used to pierce Christ on the cross. Now, the Nazis were very, you could say superstitious, but they believed in the occult to uh, a, ver a very large degree, more than any other Western government ever has. And to have the spear of destiny, meaning that they would be invincible, that no other army, even though they were so outnumbered by the Allies, could ever defeat them. Well, it's presumed they didn't really get defeated. Yes, they lost the war in Europe and their fighting forces, but they escaped with the loot. And another great book is Henry Stevens' uh, Dark Star, and he describes the final battle of World War II being a U-boat battle in the North Atlantic that wiped out the Allies. Now, we all heard the saying that history is written by the winners, and in this case, certainly this battle was written out of history just in the same way that the Battle of High Jump has not been told how that went down. Uh, yeah, pretty, uh, pretty distressing to, uh, if that is in fact the case. Um, I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about some other ancient uh, artifacts that are emerging from the, uh, the melting ice in the Antarctic. And uh, one is something that looks all the world like a, an actual a, a pyramid, 
Um, where is that reported to be, and and uh, have you seen it? And what do you what are your thoughts? So I've identified three pyramids. Can't say that any of them are authentic because when I showed pictures of the one that we've all seen with the shadow that's perfectly symmetrical like a pyramid, it's in the Ellsworth mountain range. When I showed it to the uh, person who I was talking about doing another trip down there and getting a travel outfitter to uh, take me to New Schwabenland, I would even had a uh, film crew. We were talking about going down there, but then COVID hit. But he said that 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 pyramid was just a nun attack, which just means an attractive mountain sticking through the ice. And I said, well, how do you know that? And he said, well, we fly trips from Punta Arenas, Chile. We land at an out base on Union Glacier on the Palmer Peninsula. And then we can go further afield. We can go to South Pole if people want to go there. But most people want to go to Vincent Massif, which is the tallest mountain in Antarctica. It's about 14,500 feet. But anybody who's climbed Mount Everest or Mount McKinley, Kilimanjaro in Africa, once you make it to the top of the highest mountains in the other continents, you got to go to all seven. And the hardest one to get to is Vincent Massif. So he said they flew over this pyramid on several location, uh, occasions. And I said, well, did you ever stop? Did you ever climb it or take a sample or see if it was manufactured? And he said, no, we just fly over it and we consider it a nun attack, an attractive mountain. I said, well, I guess the jury's still out. Maybe it, it could have been manufactured. So there's another uh, location that if I were ever to go back to Antarctica, I would like to check out the Ellsworth Range. Another pyramid, which is on a map of the uh, Ross Ice Shelf near McMurdo, which my colleague Eric Hecker, who lived for one year at South Pole, he was, we were at a conference together and pouring over maps and looking at material. And there it is on this big, long stretch map. It just says pyramid. And it's, it's the one that's uh, located near water that you may have seen references to. And then the other is due uh, south of New Zealand. Uh, also slightly inland, but I haven't had really good details on where to find that one. But I understand that these are the three that are largely considered the pyramids of Antarctica. Do you think you'd be allowed to get close to them? Well, that's why I asked this uh, tour operator, and he said, yeah, I guess we could. If a client really wanted to land at one, we could. But he's never done it, so... I think the jury's still out on that one. And then the other one is in McMurdo Sound could possibly be uh, gotten to, but um, Eric Hecker didn't know anybody who'd ever been out there. Uh, when are you planning to go back? <laughs> well, it's uh, pretty expensive to go. Everything you need, all the food, all the supplies, all the gear has to be transported in. So while our sailboat trip wasn't that expensive uh any kind of inland flight would be tens of thousands of dollars per person so pretty much waiting for the right production company to come along to foot the bill on that but i would certainly take the lead on logistics and where to go and hopefully be able to film a series down there i think it would be quite fascinating uh brad where are you heading to next with your uh, your Anomalies of Antarctic presentation. Yeah, I'll be speaking at the Journey to Truth conference in Grafton, Illinois, in about a month, uh, third week of May. And then I'm heading to Contact in the Desert, which is returning to uh, Palm Springs area. And then I'll be up at the Mount Shasta Summer Conference, which is uh, over the solstice weekend at beautiful Mount Shasta. Also heading to Las Vegas for the 5D event. I'm going back to Mount Shasta for the Chronicles of Gaia and rounding it out with a trip out to Orlando, Florida for the Galactic and Spiritual Informers Connection in the third week of uh, October, which will be one week after we produce the 24th annual How Weird Street Fair. So i got a busy fall coming up.
The idea of a, a hollow earth has been with us for a, a very long time. In fact, I think uh, the uh, – was it the astronomer um, Haley uh, believed that uh, the, our earth was hollow, didn't he, Brad? Yeah, he among many others. And, well, let's just look at uh, the underground bases, the deep underground military bases or dumbs through the continuity of government program produced dozens, actually 130 known deep underground military bases in the United States alone. So you could consider that being hollow earth or civilization below the surface. But when it gets really interesting is in the Jules Verne narrative, or as we were talking about earlier, the below the ice potential for civilization to exist. All right, Melissa, thank you for the call. Uh, West of the Rockies, Catherine is in beautiful British Columbia. Catherine, good morning. Welcome to Coast. Hi, Richard. Brad, I I was wondering about Noah's Ark, if that could have been at the top of the mountains that you were talking about, where you saw the mountains there. So that that's called Vincent Massif. That is just in the Trans-Antarctic Mountain Range. Uh, I do believe that uh, the rumored home of Noah's Ark is in eastern Turkey on uh, uh, Mount Ararat, I do believe. That's right, yes. There were remains of uh, Noah's Ark maybe even found a couple decades ago, but I'm not sure if wood could hold up uh, that long at a high elevation without rotting. All right. Thank you for that, Catherine. Uh, Next we have, we're going to go to Canada again. And uh, on the international line, Don is in Alberta, Canada. Don, welcome to Coast. Hi, Richard. Hi, Brad. Um, I was curious, um, a long time ago when I was digging around on the Internet in its infancy stage, it was uh, showing all the 30-degree angles between all the pyramids around the world. And one of the things that uh, straight down from the pyramids in Egypt, they showed the pyramids in Antarctica. And uh, they... There's like a huge research station there. There's like hundreds of people there, and they show them all leaving and walking off to uh, the pyramids down there. The other thing, question I have, is the um, uh, there's uh, on Bitchute, uh, 1912, Captain uh, Robert Scott. There's uh, there's uh, 61 photographs. I'm wondering if uh, you know about them and if those photographs are real. They look real, but it's and today it's, it looks like somebody released the. The pictures from somebody's old archives they had hidden or something. Some of them are actually hanging on the wall when they took pictures of them. Anyway, uh, what, what are these pictures? What are these? These pictures are of uh, the explorer Robert Scott, and what do they show? It's 1912. Bitch, it's uh, pictures of Antarctica, and it looks like uh, Tartarian uh, architecture. Um, they're they're quite good photographs, but they're all you know old black and white stuff because of the age of the when they were taken. But uh, yeah, one was the uh, re- the other. The research station uh, with the pyramids was more modern. It was like everybody was wearing like proper uh, winter gear, like you'd expect hmm. to see now if you were in a cold environment. Yeah. All right, well, Don. Thank you. Pictures. I was considering using them in my next uh, conference presentation called Birds Antarctica, but I've been able to determine that they're not of the Scott expedition and not of Antarctica. And a real easy way to debunk them is just go to any map showing the route that uh, Scott took in his race to the South Pole, just missing being the first human at the South Pole by 35 days. Raoul Amundsen of Norway was the first to make it. And regarding these photos, they show the boat, they show the coastline. It's a rocky coastline, a step pyramid and some statues with beards, but that isn't where the Scott expedition went. It landed on Ross Island uh, and crossed the Ross ice shelf before it went up the Beardmore glacier on the trans Antarctic mountains. So it, it's pretty easily debunked that that was not from the Scott expedition. Uh, do you think anybody would be allowed to travel uh, if there is an opening to the interior of the earth? Uh, did you say like at one degree below the South, the South pole, would they be allowed to travel there at this point? No, 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 no. Ever since the NSA was, 
open. It, and it, and not until the uh, 1980s was it even uh, acknowledged. It was always called no such agency. Well, they were set up, tasked to take uh, control of any craft that came down or anything extraterrestrial, including offering security around this hole in the ice. And it's reported that the NSA uh, goes in and out of the South Pole Station and there's a building at McMurdo, an unmarked building, but is r- widely regarded by everybody as being the NSA building where they uh, do their operations. So if there are any kind of UFO craft, activity, down craft, NSA is Johnny on the spot taking care of it. And what happens if you try to look uh, using Google Earth at – that precise location, one degree just below the, the South Pole. What do you what do you see? Times, Richard, and what you'll find is a sloppy Photoshop layer, just a white rectangle thrown over, and, and you can see the contours of the ice, and then just a straight line rectangle white. They don't even try to hide it or <laughs> disguise it at all using the uh, masking tool to to copy the contour of the land. Up, nope, just big white rectangle over that area. Not just Cusco, Peru, where there have been reported entrances into this network of underground chambers uh, and passages, but it extends pretty much up the spine of the entire Andes Mountains, going all the way to Colombia, as well as Ecuador, throughout Peru, and even down into uh, Chile and portions of Argentina and Brazil is this network of tunnels. Uh, to my knowledge, they've all been sealed up. It's very hard to get in there. But one of the people who was on my ship down to Antarctica was in uh, Oruru, Bolivia, and he said they went up to one of these entrances, and he actually got down in it, and there were stairs leading down, and the people in his group kind of chickened out. He wishes he had gone further, but he said that was one of the entrances into this tunnel network. Great question, Matt. Wow. I don't know where those two hours went, Brad, but it was a whirlwind and um, just always amazing uh, spending some time with you and uh, your adventures. Thank you so much for this. Oh, you're very welcome, Richard. Thanks for having me on. It's always great talking to you, too. Known each other a couple of years, and uh, every time we talk, it's a great surprise and excellent conversation. All right, my friend, be well, safe travels, and uh, hope to talk again soon. Brad Olson. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners, and new users will also receive a free two-week trial.